I was for a very long time the only person who believed in me and I did it. I fucking did it, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> Social media is not easy, but if you get it right, it can have profound effects on your personal brand and your business. Today we speak to a social media superstar who has grown a community of over 130,000 LinkedIn followers and garnered over 20 million views on her content, working with brands like Yahoo, Petco and Buzzfeed. She's now helping dozens of brands generate significant revenue on social media and positioning them as experts in the industry by creating engaging and compelling video content. This episode was shot just a few days before the COVID lockdown. So as the world reopens again, we thought this was perfect timing to release this episode and to inspire you to take your social media game to the next level. Please enjoy this week's episode with the queen of LinkedIn, Miss Shay Robottom. So Shay, thank you for making it up to Newport Beach. I know it's painful to come to this uh, to this part so of the world. So painful! Oh my gosh! Oh, no, it's great. Thank you for having me, Matthew. You're welcome. Um, I thought I'd kind of get the LinkedIn dress code. I don't normally wear this sort of stuff, and but mm. I, th I thought I'd try and be kind of you know contextual. Oh really? So you you're normally more casual. I am. Yeah. That's so funny because I believe that it's shifting a lot in the business world in terms of what people wear. Really? Because so many people, we live in a gig economy, so many people are working from home, um, so many entrepreneurs kind of, uh, I feel in my generation, like they don't dress professional. Like this is what I wear, you know, and I do, and I will, you know, for certain occasions, put on the blazer or whatever, but I think that it's shifting where people are starting to realize like, why don't we just go to work dressed like how we normally dress? You know, is it really necessary? So it's super funny that you say you wore that for LinkedIn because I'm like, oh, I don't even wear that for LinkedIn. I just, I just try to be my, my true self. And it's actually, it's, it's worked out for me. Like people respond to it. Mm. And then I feel that I give people permission to like, oh yeah, like I can just wear what I want. Mm. I like an excuse to put on a suit, and to be honest, I you do look good in this. I, uh, I had this. I, I also fresh. picked yeah. it up yesterday, and I thought as an excuse to wear it and uh, to plug my tailor. But there it's you go. It's nice. I like the blue. <laughs> it's something different as opposed to just boring black. So, and that's the other thing. If I'm going to dress professional, it's got to be like a pink blazer. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Or like bright yellow, something fun. You sound like my daughter. She'd probably wear a pink pink blazer. I think. <laughs> like I want to like emulate like yo, I'm here for business. <laughs> but I'm also a good time. Like, like we're here to have fun too. So. <laughs> so talking about context, you know, with, with you're the LinkedIn expert, I think with, you know, 4 million plus video views. So I've, oh, it's I've, like over 20 million. 20 million. Yeah. Now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and LinkedIn being, I, I suppose it's not something that you would think as a social media platform. I mean, in general, it's not. It, you, you kind of look at the Instagrams and the Facebooks and, and that, mm -hmm. that side of things. And, and I suppose being a business owner trying to figure out my way around the different platforms, it's, it, you know, what, do, do you think there's a difference in terms of how you need to show up on, on LinkedIn? Or do you think as it's becoming more of a common social media platform that some of the rules that you would apply to building a business on Instagram, for example, would apply. Mm -hmm. what, what, what was your thoughts What's on that? What's the difference? Yeah. yeah. Um, I would say that it's, it's uh, the content strategies that work on other platforms are actually more effective on LinkedIn just as is than people realize. I do, you know, things differently on LinkedIn because it is a business platform, because the audience there is more in a business mindset. They do want content that ties back to business or is relevant to uh, personal development, growth, money mindset, you know, so you can get a little broad topic wise on LinkedIn, but I do think it's smart to keep it business related. Um, but there's just so little competition. That's the thing. Like I'm out here in Newport Beach, you know, I'm meeting with all of these amazingly established business professionals and I am just continually amazed at how underutilized LinkedIn is. I mean, and a lot of these people will even be um, influencers of sorts on other platforms. So like, oh, I have half a million followers on Instagram. I have a million YouTube subscribers, but literally nothing on LinkedIn. Some of them don't even have a profile on LinkedIn. And I'm like, okay, this is why I've had such an advantage because I went to the platform. Well, I went there just like anyone else looking for leads originally. And I did find leads, but I also found like it, insanely easy to grow, especially with my video marketing background and all the principles I could apply to my own personal brand on LinkedIn. Now it was like, 
wow, nobody's like treating LinkedIn like a place to grow a, a blog and a, and a brand. And so that's what I found is um, it's a lot, it's, it's actually a lot more similar to the other platforms in terms of what works, but people just don't look at it as uh, an option, mm. which is crazy because this is where all the money is. Like, and there's a lot less fluff because of that too. There's a lot less like BS content. Like you go on Facebook, it's like, okay, maybe there's some business content, but it's also like a cat video. You know, it's also like <laughs> something about the, the government or Trump, you know, like, like LinkedIn is, is uh, a cleaner feed, mm -hmm. I would say, and a great feed for those who want all the personal development content, want to be surrounded by business owners who are like, you know, giving valuable advice, um, making money, growing, without all the fluff and without all the BS. It's like, it's a tailored feed if you're just looking to grow and cultivate um, meaningful business relationships, mm. yeah. So you're certainly someone that I've seen in the last year or so pop up as, as a kind of a, I guess you call it an influencer, but, but great content, very Thank you. present. Um, and, and Wendy as well, who managed to sort of pull this together, picked you up She's even before what fan. I did. Love her, <laughs> Wendy, yeah. <laughs> so you, you're not just creating te you know, interesting videos. There's, there's a lot more behind the story. So just give us a little bit of background of how you got to where you were, what was involved and, and why you made some of those decisions. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's funny. I realized I didn't talk about this enough on my LinkedIn. Like a lot of my following doesn't really know my background in video marketing and how I learned all of this. Um, so I was, I was originally a musician, <laughs> not a great one, but I, I was literally, I was trying to make it an entertainment. I had dropped out of college at 20. I just, I knew college wasn't for me. I was like super artistic. I just wanted to make art and music and perform. And I was like, I'll figure it out on my own. Like I got like a waitressing job and started doing music, but I didn't know social media. I didn't know business at all. I was very naive. Um, and I couldn't market myself online. I just couldn't figure it out. I, I, I eventually hit that wall where I'm like, okay, this, this isn't working, which I see a lot of artists and creative types. They don't even allow themselves to um, make a decision to quit, even if it's very logical and pragmatic because of the ego of the artist. Like, no, I can't sell out. I can't. I'm like, that is bullshit. Like I, the best thing I ever did was quit my dreams, which sounds crazy. But what ended up happening is I met a page owner on Facebook. It was my very first client. He had about, he had a, a, a blog on Facebook that was very profitable. It was uh, about 3 million likes, 3 million followers at the time that he hired me to edit video content for him. And I knew, this guy was my age, and I knew that he was making like a ton of money, passive income even, because he was funneling traffic from the Facebook page to a website and selling Google ads. So it was like the more clicks he got, the more money he made. I mean, he was 23 making money in his sleep. I'm waitressing, there's like four people at my rap show. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I need to like, something needs to change. So I just worked for this guy. And, I, and I'm like, teach me everything. And I was like a sponge. Started out very much as like a video freelancer. I was just editing for him. Um, he had a lot of other uh, friends on Facebook with large pages. They started to see the results from the videos that I was doing for his page. So I got another client, then I got another client, then I got another. And before I knew it, I had like a company. I, I quit my waitressing job. I was doing viral video content for all of the biggest pages on Facebook, curating and licensing video clips. So the cute dog or the cute cat, like I mentioned earlier, like it was literally my job to track down the original owner of that media and facilitate uh, a license for the video to use it on all of my clients' pages. So that is what I actually did for uh, almost three or two and a half, three years before I even got on LinkedIn right. and made my own video content. And with that, just on that um, editing, was that, yeah. you, you, you sort of mentioned that you're quite creative. Mm -hmm. Was that just something that you were passionate about and you found your groove that you could actually do that pretty good or, or um, did you have to work at it? No, so that's the other thing. I didn't grow up very techy at all. Like I was one of the last generations to play outside. You know, I, I really, my parents were very strict. We didn't have cable. I didn't have a lot of computer or internet time. So I learned video editing after I got into music because I started making music videos mm. for myself and I started to meet a lot of videographers and that's when the intrigue for video came. Like, oh, I could actually like learn 
how to do video myself, but it was a very tough learning curve for me because I, I was not techie. Mm. I still don't consider myself a very techie person at all, which is funny as I've founded two tech startups now, but it's like, it was rough for me to get through that learning curve. I mean, I remember in the beginning when I was doing these videos, it would take me like 10 hours just to edit like a 60 second clip because I was so new to Premiere. And then I did it so much and so much. You eventually just blow through that and, and get get quick and now I don't edit uh, anymore either. I don't, mm. I can, but I don't have to, which is very nice. <laughs> yeah. so. And do you, do, with, with the style, like certainly the stuff that you do yourself has got a very unique style that seems to work really, really well on those platforms. Is that something that you've evolved as part of what you do? Is, and we talked about it off camera, but having people that are trained in, you know, they come from university and trained in classic mm, video yeah. editing. Um, yeah, I am amazed that more people don't know how to edit for social media. I mean, really, it is absurd. Even marketing companies, even like I, I feel so privileged to have had that first business, my first company on Facebook where I worked for all those blog owners because I literally, I mean, like all of my clients were really, really talented in understanding how to get attention online and specifically in the newsfeed. Hmm. Like I always joke, I could have been paying them because they taught me so much about it. I didn't know anything. I knew how to edit at that point, but I didn't know like, you know, you got to have headlines, you got to have faster pacing. It's got to be punchy. You need like all the science behind what goes into a social media video still very misunderstood very misunderstood. I mean, I, I do this as well. One of my services that I provide is I'll go into companies and train their marketing team and their editing team that they already have on how to make these videos for social media because it's just not widespread knowledge yet. And uh, Is that just because it's so new and nobody's really, fit, you know, you, people have just evolved? And, and I, I mean, yeah, it, it's just new. I mean, I, I'm surprised that it's it is becoming more common that people like know the science of the social media video, the newsfeed video. But I gotta say, four years ago when I first got into this industry, I remember like it was like I was moving because I was so scared in a way of the competition, like figuring out this formula in the next couple months, in the next six months. And I'm like, in a year, everyone's gonna know this, and like I need to take advantage now and like go hard while while I have this opportunity. And it's been four years and I am still amazed. Like, wow, a lot of people just still don't know this. And that's what I did on my LinkedIn is I applied the principles to viral video and what I saw other influencers doing on Facebook. Because remember, I was working with content owners too, not just the page owners. I was facilitating relationships between content creators and page owners. So through the content creators, that's where I really got to see what works. I got to see, um, you know, the the kind of talking head cut style video, which I myself do now, that was like, I was licensing videos like that from creators. So I knew that worked. Um, I knew skit content worked because I had a lot of um, actor type uh, uh, people in the, in the library database that were making funny spoofs and skits. Um, so yeah, you know, it just, it, it was a no brainer. I got on LinkedIn. I'm like, oh wow, videos on LinkedIn now, but like no one's really using video. And then I'm like, and the ones who are using video, like they have no idea what they're doing. So I'm going to just uh, blow the lid off it, take everything I learned on Facebook, apply it to LinkedIn and it worked and it's still working. And now there's a lot of people emulating what I've brought to LinkedIn and, and kind of, you know, copying for lack of a better word, mm. my style, which I definitely wear like a badge. Like I'm super proud of that. And I'm, I'm happy to see other uh, business owners taking advantage of the opportunity on this platform. Mm. So you sold your first company, is that I correct? I did, yeah. And then you opened what, what more of a LinkedIn focus agency? Exactly, yeah. So it was, it, it was a viral video company. We also did ad campaigns. We ran, you know, digital media buying campaigns for products on Facebook and Instagram. Um, but we didn't do anything on LinkedIn. I, I, I pivoted completely to LinkedIn. So a lot of what I teach it's similar and it comes from what I learned on Facebook, but it's all focused around LinkedIn and helping business owners, primarily B2B owners, um, get, yeah, get their message out there, create hmm. effective content because it's so challenging. A lot of these business owners I'll see, they'll like dump uh, thousands of dollars into videos and production and like the post goes nowhere because they're not optimizing it for social media. Hmm. A lot of these marketing companies or, you know, like film agencies, they're still making videos for companies that are like, 
maybe like a website video or like a television commercial. It's not optimized for the newsfeed. And then they're out thousands of dollars and they think, oh, I'm never hiring another marketing company again. And that's where I come in. I'm like, no, like there, there's a way to do these videos effectively for social media, for LinkedIn, and uh, consistently and not for, for a lot of money. You don't have to break the bank. It's actually quite easy and you don't need to invest in a, in a fancy setup or anything. You just need to know the science behind what makes a good video for social media because it's not cinematic, flawless production quality. It's actually the context of the message. And I think we all know by now, like we've all shared a video on social media that was clearly shot on someone's cell phone and it went viral. So, mm. so one, one of the things I think is worth mentioning because I was quite impressed with what you'd been able to achieve at an age where I was sort of still bumming around in nightclubs is that you started your first business extremely young. I'm back in the nightclubs a little bit. I'm single now. So I'm like, I'm out there a little bit, but yeah, I had an unorthodox twenties, man. I like, I became an introvert, didn't go out, didn't have friends, just worked. But you built, you built your first business when you were sort of early twenties. Uh, yeah. So let me think I was 23 when I started and that's when I like quit everything. I quit my music. I went like complete 180 because I was a waitress, which, you know, when you're in the service industry, you're pretty much automatically an alcoholic. No, I'm just kidding. But I did, I did party a lot. I was a musician. So I was like, I knew a lot of promoters, club owners. Like I was going out every weekend, like not only promoting my music, but like partying. I was like a young in my twenties, free, like excited. And I wore like tons of makeup. I used to wear like weaves. I had like fake eyelashes. I did the whole thing. And then when I turned 23, I completely pivoted. Like it was like I just hit a wall where I'm like, you know, what, what does Tony Robbins say? Like massive change requires massive action. I stopped everything. I quit drinking. I quit going out. I literally just sat in front of my computer all day, every day, went for a walk at the end of the day. That was like my reward. Like I'd go for a walk. Um, and I'm really happy that I did that because it was ultimately the grind that was needed to discipline me to balance out all of that kind of like feminine, right brain, creative energy and like give me some of the masculine, some of the doing, some of the like structure of like, okay, here's how you actually build a business. And now I'm able to kind of merge those two talents of mine. But I will say that um, I went a little too hard mm. with like being introverted those years and not going out and not having friends. Like I, I don't think it's necessary to go to the extreme I went to, to have the results because now I'm 27 and I'm like, Oh man, like I, you know, I've never been to a music festival. I know, you know, I, I, so I just like recently and I, and I did go through a breakup, which is part of it. So I'm single now and I'm finding myself like, Oh wow. Like I really missed having girlfriends and just like going out and like doing fun things. So I would say I'm a little more, balanced overall now right. yeah i just went the other way including the makeup and the hair stuff you know <laughs> yeah yeah oh my gosh That's so funny. i start i was a late start so yeah it is, it is impressive for uh, you know to to have i guess achieve what what you've done do, do you think that the the niche that you've got now where you're able to advise a lot of big companies is is because i suppose you're you know the fact that you probably look at things with maybe a a, a different set of eyes. So you, I, I guess you, you come from maybe a younger perspective where you've grown up with some of that technology, but you can kind of also see like the traditional businesses and how to connect them. Do you think, do you think your, your sort of age is, is, is a, an advantage at seeing these opportunities? Um, yeah, I mean, I would definitely say my age is an advantage given that like I knew social media, I was a user of social media before I started working on it. Um, but I would say even ju just like being a millennial or someone that grew up with it, like, isn't enough. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people my age I meet and they still, back to what I said earlier, know nothing about how to optimize content for social media. I really think I need uh, that last agency was the experience I needed to like, oh, okay, I get it. But also um, naturally, you know, because I do have a performing background and I've always been very creative as a child. I was always like making something. I do feel that I probably more so than the average person just have a knack for connecting for uh, uh being able to um produce an emotional response from people to um grab attention to captivate an audience i mean that was kind of always there in me but i didn't know 
how to apply it on social media. Mm. So, did you have was was your family at the time? With you know, were they encouraging? Were they sort of like entrepreneurial? And because it seemed it's unusual to sort of go into the direction you did without some sort of support around you. So I would say that I did not have support from my family. I actually attribute a lot of my success to cutting out my family, really? which is a controversial <laughs> thing. Yeah, people are like, oh, your family, like, but it's family. I'm like, but it's abuse. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But like, they, I started to realize that the need for their approval constantly, like having a filter on everything I did of like, okay, but what will my like big sisters think of me? Like, you know, that child in me still seeking their approval. I, I had to get rid of it. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to cut them off completely. Um, and that is when I really started to grow. That's when my business started making more money. That's when I blew up on LinkedIn. Um, because as a child, um, I would say it was mixed. Like there was some members of my family who supported it, but overall, like they did not agree with the entertainment thing. Like me being a singer, me dropping out of school, that was like a no, no to everyone. All of my sisters did like the traditional, like safe education route, get a job, my parents are entrepreneurs, actually. Um, so, you know, they kind of always encouraged, like, yeah, you can make your own business, but they were really uncomfortable with the music thing. <laughs> so I had to figure it out on my own. I, I would say, like, I didn't really figure it out. Like, I actually just got taken advantage of quite a bit back when I was trying to be a singer. I was just very naive, didn't have a support system, but I ended up finding video, and I ended up finding social media. So it was actually such a good thing to invest in and that's why I tell people, look, if your family is saying like, no, like you got to do X, Y, and Z. We don't want you going on this path. There can be a level of love in that, like genuine love of like, no, I, I genuinely just like want to see my kids succeed. I'm afraid that the route that they're going down is, is um, just going to make them less fulfilled in the long run. But a lot of times it's really coming from narcissistic parenting. It's really coming from the parent living through the kid wanting like, well, I always envisioned my kid would be a doctor. So like be a doctor. So I always tell people if you're feeling like I really want to do X, but my family really wants me to do Y, do X, like just do it. Because in my case, no, I didn't end up becoming Britney Spears, but look what happened. Hmm. I mean, I ended up learning everything I needed to know about digital marketing, business, becoming an entrepreneur. And, um, yeah, I don't really think anyone in my family would like be telling me to go back to college anymore. No. You know, it's like, but it's hard. It's really hard to go against the grain. Yeah. And that's why you got to find friends who support it. Like find friends and, and you can make that your family. Hmm. So family is love, not blood. That's what I always say. Yeah. Family are the people who support you unconditionally, um, you know, still give you the honest truth, still give you the tough love that you need, but they're not out for themselves. They're out for you. They can objectively look at you as a separate person to them and say, yeah, you know what? I think that'd be good for you, Shay. Yeah, you know what? I think you'd thrive over there. Good for you. Family often has an attachment. Like this kid or this sister or this parent is like somehow connected to me, like a reflection of me. And that hinders them actually objectively um, being able to look at what's best for you. Mm. So that's my experience with family. And I feel a lot of people have a blind spot for their family and if they would just cut that cord not forever but just for a while like literally if, if you're feeling like you're getting the sense that your family's dragging you down seriously just cut them out for a year <laughs> just do it just cut them out for a year minimal contact do your own thing for a year tell me your life doesn't improve <laughs> i think one of the things about what the the kind of business you're in um which is i, I guess creating your own sort of media mm -hmm. brand and, and channel is I suppose in the past people would normally go to school and they would, it, would, it would gradually evolve over a number of years. Nowadays you're able to turn your iPhone on, publish instantly mm -hmm. and, and that sort of um, period where you go from awful, which I'm, I'm sure you know, everybody I've met that's been done this well, of, you know, they didn't awful start that good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So going from awful, having family and friends that are then very opinionated, ah. one, why the hell are you doing it, mm -hmm. two, what are you saying whilst you're trying to build your confidence up at the same time, which is very easily sort of broken? You know, what, what's your thoughts to, because it, certainly it's undeniable that there's a lot of power if you can get in front of a camera, speak, tell your story and whatever that is. You know, it's, it's undeniable that that works, but very few people can do it. And probably my, my experience is very few people have got the confidence to go through what it needs to get to where you are. Even if, they, even if they're average, you can do quite well by being average. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts about how to 
get through that early stage of building your confidence and not necessarily being affected by people's views while you're getting there? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked me that because it's actually a common thing that comes up with my clients. They have confidence issues. I always joke. I'm like, I'm not a video coach. I'm a confidence <laughs> coach <laughs> because that's 90% of it is like feeling like you are of value. So I always tell people, I'm like, look, if you've been in your industry, you know, 5, 10, 20 years, you undoubtedly have value to provide around that your specific area of expertise and a lot of people fall victim to the like oh i don't want to see myself on camera i'm worried about what others think i don't really know if what i have to share is is valuable to fall victim to those insecurities is selfish because no two people have the same walk of life so you inevitably have value to provide that no one else can that you're just withholding from the world by not showing up on video. Hmm. So the beginning is the hardest, but once you can get over that hump, um, and, and definitely the people that know you, that are closest to you, will be the most uncomfortable. Because they don't know you as you know Fred, hmm. the video guy. They know <laughs> you as uh, whatever your identity was when you met them. So that's like a lot of the pushback you'll get is from the people you know. Um, people who just met me as Shay, the video girl, they're never like, they would never be like, Shay, why are you doing videos? Mm. You know, it's, it's only people that know you as not that, that start to get uncomfortable. And it's actually usually just because they're uncomfortable and they want to bring you back down so that they can be on your same, uh, that, that, that they can feel more comfortable again. Like I'm not doing videos. I'm not growing a personal brand. So watching you do what I won't is very uncomfortable to me. Therefore I'm going to, you know, kind of manipulate and, and poke at you and, and criticize you got to get past it it's going to happen people mm -hmm. are going to criticize you it's there's no way around it um i think the longer you do it you just get tough mm. is it a bit like your your family advice where it's like probably just cut people off for a year and then sort of come back again yeah. when you're... and then and, and it's funny too like i had a lot of friends um that i gave up you know early on because of what i just mentioned it was like I could tell they were uncomfortable with me like becoming a singer or like becoming a, like they didn't know me as that. They grew up with me a, as a different person and I, you know, ignored their judgments, kept doing it anyways. And then it's like it took a few years of me really solidifying myself in the video marketing space and getting enough validation um, that they'll come back around. Mm. You know, now I have friends who in high school would have never shared my content or like supported what I was doing, but now they do. Like now they're like, oh my God, I saw you in Entrepreneur Magazine, I shared it with my dad, and I'm like, okay, like now you're finally, so it does shift, you know, at a certain point, you just establish yourself um, and people kind of give up, I guess you yeah. could say. Let's talk about LinkedIn. Why is it such an interesting opportunity according to you? I watched a bunch of your videos and you seem to be sort of you know, obviously full in, you've got a business around this. What, you know, why, why is it important? Why should business owners take notice? Yes. Well, there's no other social media platform with this many educated people on it with money. So like I was saying, you know, at, when people log into Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, they're not necessarily in a business mindset. Uh, they're usually looking, you know, to be entertained, to laugh, to catch up with old friends. Maybe if you catch them in the right moment, you know, they could be receptive to your business messaging on those platforms. But it's really the opposite with LinkedIn. People log into LinkedIn because they're looking for a job. They're looking for employees. They're looking for partners, vendors, someone that's going to solve their problem. And they typically have the money and the power to make decisions uh, around purchasing your services. So right away on LinkedIn, you're going to be reaching a way more targeted audience if you're doing anything business, even B2C. I mean, anything right. business related. Uh, is going to hit more people in the right place on LinkedIn because they are already in that business mindset. Now, on top of that, um, it's kind of like what's going on with TikTok right now. There's so many users on LinkedIn, but very few creating content. So uh, when the platforms only have so much content to pull from to show people in the feed, your video is inevitably going to show up, you know, mm -hmm. more so than platforms like Instagram or Facebook where it's completely oversaturated, overrun. So on LinkedIn the organic content opportunity is massive. You can run ads on LinkedIn, and I, I actually know a lot of people doing that successfully in B2B and B2C, um, but really it's organic. I mean, like everything I've done is organic. You can reach a ton of people. There's still 
very little competition on video because video just came out as a feature on LinkedIn a few years ago. Hmm. So still not a lot of businesses taking advantage of the video content opportunity. And um, yeah, like I said, just way too many profiles, not enough people making content. So you're inevitably inevitably going to show up in the feed. Right. I know you've, um, in preparing for this, I watched some of the videos where you talk about the numbers in terms of profiles and active users. Do you, do you have any sort of relatively up-to-date uh, in numbers on you know the amount of people that are on it as opposed to producing um I don't know if I have the updated one the last I checked it was like 600 over 600 million profiles but like a fraction of that even log in like monthly really yeah so it's growing I mean it's I, I do think that overall people are still sleeping on this platform um which is like, it's good and bad. Mm. I would say it's good for me in that there's still no competition. Like people aren't really taking advantage of it in the way that I am, especially with now TikTok. Like to, it was kind of finally like people were like, oh, I think LinkedIn and then TikTok. <laughs> and now it's like the focus is away from LinkedIn again, but the opportunity is still there. I mean, it's, it's massive. So um, I would say that overall it's getting, like people are starting to realize, oh, there's a huge opportunity to grow here and get business and, and get inbound leads. But it's kind of like what I said earlier about things taking way longer than I think they will. Like, oh, the competition's gonna hit like tomorrow. And it's, it's slowly, it's, it's a slow roll, so. Mm. I could imagine some business owners or CEOs listening to this and thinking, okay, you know, that all sounds good. There's a, there's a, you know, it's the next social media platform. But what, what does that mean to me as the business owner in terms of, you know, how would this, how can this impact my business? You know, mm -hmm. is it going to bring me new customers? Mm -hmm. Is it going to increase my revenue? Is it a branding play where I just need to be on there to keep top of mind? What, what is the sort of yeah, thing I, mean, I can expect? No, it's a great question. It totally depends on the industry, depends on what your offers are. Um, but I would say long-term play in most cases, this is a social media platform where if you just release ads every day asking for stuff or pitching, nobody's going to follow you. And that's what a lot of people on LinkedIn are also missing. It's like they think content is ads, but you need to just build a trusted page that people start to recognize as a source for good, as a source for giving, as a source for... Um, you know, the, this, this page is just con continuously providing free value to me without asking for anything in return. That's what I've done. And that's what I see a lot of business owners struggle with. They want the instant ROI. You can still have that. I did. I was immediately getting inbound leads the second I started making videos and I was not asking for anything. I was just grabbing attention. And then inevitably people click back to my profile. Now, once you get on my LinkedIn profile, it's very clear what I do. It's very clearly like an ad for my services. It's optimized for conversions. It's like, hey, by the way, I help with LinkedIn video marketing. Message me here. And that's where the leads come from. But the people make the decision on their own to reach out because you've established trust with them. You've given them something. So now they're willing to give back like, oh, wait, I think I am going to message this company to learn more. Um, and that's the science a lot of business owners don't realize. You know, I work with a lot of people in very niche industries and they want to only ever talk about their niche and I'm like look that's great you should because you do want to flex your skills in your industry and establish yourself as an authority there um, but in order to just get attention and just get people on your profile it is good to be a little more broad a little more general um, being personal you know and not all CEOs or business people are willing to go here but at the end of the day, people do do business with people. And I found a really a strong advantage I have is people just feel like they know me. You know, I, I show up and I meet Wendy and it's like, it's really not like any surprise. She's like, I already know Shay because I show up very authentically in my videos every day. I'm not in the suit and tie trying to be like this stuffy businesswoman. I'm like, no, you know, I'm just me. And that creates a level of uh, human connection in the buyer where they're like, they start to see themselves doing business with you a lot easier than if you're just a really, you know, filtered, stuffy business page that- You're talking about my suit now. <laughs> no, no. But um, yeah, for, for CEOs that are willing to- I'm gonna drop the suit, okay. Uh, yeah, take the suit off, Matthew. What's going on here? So um, 
Yeah, I would say, you know, the, the comfort level is also different for everyone. I, I have other uh, business friends on the platform who are like, ah, I don't really like getting personal. That's not how I am in my day to day anyways. I'm just not a very open type. So I don't want and I'm like, that's fine. You know, you don't have to. But um, for a business owner that is willing to be the face of their own company, get on camera, great opportunity. Or if that's not you, you know, find someone in your company who is willing to talk on behalf of the company. Maybe a sales guy who's like super extroverted anyways and is really great on camera. Start having someone in the company be the face on LinkedIn, grow a page and funnel all that traffic back to the business. Mm. So I can imagine the conversation around the boardroom where, um, you know, with the with the finance people and the and the business owner, it's like, yeah, we want you to spend time creating content when you're running a multi-million pound dollar company. Why would that make any sense to anybody mm -hmm. to do something like that? Yeah, well, the answer is it doesn't make sense to a lot of business owners because they're still having success on traditional channels, which I totally get. Like as a business owner, it's like, you know, don't fix what's not broken. The problem is the older generation is going to die off and all of those traditional mediums for advertising like uh, newspaper, television especially, I mean, those are going to become very weak platforms. Everything in advertising, all the dollars are slowly but surely shifting to social media. So business owners need to consider that in the next 10, 20, 30 years, if they aren't growing a platform online, if they aren't you know, providing free value to gain trust with an audience, they're not only missing out on an opportunity to promote their own offers down the line when things start to shift and social media becomes more and more powerful for advertising, but they're also missing out on an opportunity to curate other advertising dollars from people that want to promote on their platforms. So that's what I always say. It's not, it's not just about you building it for your business mm -hmm. so you can promote your own service because your competitors are going to. And this is what's happening all the time. This is what Gary Vee talks about. He's like, I know lawyers who are way more talented in law. They have way more experience, but they call me and they're like, Gary, you know, there's this young lawyer guy and he's stealing all my business and he sucks, but he's doing these videos on social media and everyone's calling him. It's like, yeah, that's the play. Like, so I would say you need to get outside of like, okay, this is working now because you, you really need to look ahead at what's going to die. And I do believe television is dying and everyone who has a, a budget for marketing is going to in the future spend their marketing budget promoting on social media channels. So not only do you now have a channel you've built to promote your own offers, you can start to collect some advertising dollars from other companies who perhaps have an affinity audience with you where their product is also valuable to your audience and, and you can start to collect more advertising dollars that way as well. They're like the new, the new um, the social media channels are becoming the new television channels is right. the way I say it, yeah. So in terms of a strategy to, for people who are listening to this to start thinking, you know, a, a direction to start considering, it's, it's really then your, you, in order to sort of start having a presence, for, to, for, to, to start having a virtual relationship mm -hmm. with you, almost like I suppose we're getting to know each other today where you, you, you learn about that person and then through that, through learning about that person and similar interests and things, you then feel more comfortable and, and you yes. develop trust with wanting to buy them. Is that essentially what people should be thinking about? Yes, yeah. And, and that is something I definitely also learned in my time on Facebook is like, oh, vulnerable content sells. But for me, I kind of also got into it by accident because I started like opening up about my mental health struggles years ago now. But when I first got on LinkedIn, um, I was just super raw. I remember releasing a video about how admitting that I had depression and thinking like I'm committing business suicide by doing this and I got leads from it. And I'll never forget, that was kind of the turning point for me. I was like, wait a minute, like this is almost like a cry for help. I'm just like at my wits end, like I'm depressed. I don't even care who knows it anymore. I want to talk about it. But so many people, especially in the business world, because a lot of people who are depressed throw themselves into their work even more. So they're on LinkedIn, you know, <laughs> it was like, I got so many messages from people saying, I have this too. And I feel like I can't talk about it. I don't want my business partner to know. I don't want my clients or my wife even to know. It was like crazy to me. I'm like, oh, so I realized there was an opportunity to give people, especially in the business world and the business climate to give people permission to be human mm -hmm. and to be flawed. I mean, that's a lot of what you see on LinkedIn is like the humble brags, 
oh, we just landed this account. We're in Forbes. We're doing all. We're, we're mm. great. We're great. We're great. I'll get on there and say, like, I totally messed up with this client. This client fired me, and this is what happened. You know what I mean? Like, and people are like, wow, because <laughs> that's what people can really relate to. Like, the failure, the, 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 when things aren't going well, feeling depressed, feeling insecure. Um, so I would say that vulnerability was just an extra step in getting people to connect with me on a human level and picture themselves doing business with me. That seems, you know, that I, I suppose for, certainly from some of the people I know that being vulnerable, mm -hmm. so like even in front of, you know, not, not even with a camera on you, it seems a, a difficult thing to do. Um, yeah. Um, but do you, are you saying that, you know, the more sort of honest and authentic you can be about what's happening, the more you're likely to be able to connect with people and, and to sort of achieve what you want. Is that what I, I think so. Like, don't get me wrong. I do believe that I turn people off being my true self, but I've learned that it's good that I'm turning these people off because this, this happens in life in general, not just business, but like people think they need to act a certain way. So there's a, a filter they put over themselves. There's a level of fakeness that they have. <laughs> thinking this is the way to be accepted and they are accepted but they just attract people who accept the fake them <laughs> so what i've done is i've kind of filtered out all the people who won't align with me my mission my core values long term by being my true self no doubt i've lost business i've lost i've lost people who are like this shay chick is crazy we would never do business with her but it's probably someone who themselves struggles with their own authenticity who's really uncomfortable by what I'm doing, who wouldn't jive with me down the line long term anyways. So I've actually found that I attract clients who are like, almost like fans, almost like, oh gosh, I love you, Shay. And then, and then we work way better together because mm -hmm. we're on that same wavelength. I haven't had to hide any of my true self to maintain a business relationship. We just go in it from the start. They know me, they know my strengths, they know my weaknesses. And um, it's beautiful because you really like, you, you, you make real friends, guys. Mm. That's how you make real friends, and you just be your real self, so. And I guess in terms of the lead process, if you, in, just in a traditional business, you know, you kind of, you're getting a bunch of leads in, they go through the sales process, and you actually find they're not what you want anyway. So I suppose yeah, it's probably a way of disqualifying right. before they, they come into your sales or marketing funnel anyway. So it probably yeah. is more cost effective to Right. Do that, that, I mean, that qualifying process for me is more so just, business like what is your revenue what you know like it, mm -hmm. it doesn't I'm not like asking people like do you like my depression videos or anything like that right. <laughs> no, but I, I suppose, how much of a fan are you we need to establish that first no yeah I, I suppose though you and you must have had it you, you can if, if you're not kind of narrowing down exactly who you're going after you can be trying to go after everybody, mm -hmm. um, whether it's a premium product or a, mm -hmm. you know, a budget product. I, I guess the more you can sort of make sure that those leads, however you're investing in them, are, are kind of optimized, the, yes. the, the better, particularly if you've got a large sales team, you know, you right. kind of want people coming in if they're gonna be going in your direction, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. And, and that is also a benefit of what I do, because I talk a lot about casting the net and just getting attention. Mm. Um, but my marketing services apply to any industry. So I'm not really limited. It's just like, are you a business owner who sees the value in social media? What's your product? I mean, they're, in rare cases, I will turn down a client if they really, I really don't feel that I can get them a return on what they're doing. But um, it's any industry for me. So that also makes my job easier. Mm. Yeah. Are you finding any industries that are working particularly well with LinkedIn over others? Are you, or is it... You know, in your experience, is it pretty universal? That consultants. Consultants. Consultants, salespeople, still recruiters for sure. I mean, it's still a great place to find a job if you're a job seeker. Um, but recruiters, anyone who's selling some sort of like business consulting service, like a business coach, even, a, you know, a lot of my clients are um, life coaches. Life coaches, that's like buzzing now. I get them now. on the email so yeah, all the time. Yeah, executive <laughs> coaches, that's like buzzing now in the professional world. Um, insurance, technology, uh, marketing, a lot of marketers like mm -hmm. myself, a lot of my clients are actually marketers, a lot of marketers buy my programs. So, so that's fun. Um, and actually, I'm glad that you asked that question because the next industry that I see starting to buzz and emerge on LinkedIn is actually, um, health, wellness, and fitness. Mm -hmm. So that's starting, we're starting to see a lot more, uh, trainers, like per, like literally like personal trainers sharing like tips about how to stay healthy, how to stay fit. Um, 
and, and other like health and wellness services and, mm. and that sort of thing. So. One of the things we, so as a, in our company, we use LinkedIn Navigator. Yeah, um, Sales I, Navigator. Yeah, and, and, and I guess a lot of people that email me are using Navigator. And one yeah. of the things that sort of annoys me a little bit is you kind of get these emails and, and someone's kind of like, um, you know, a little bit of a pitch. Some of the pitch is like, you've probably not even read my profile. Mm, um, yes. And then they're like, you know, are you good at six o'clock or eight o'clock kind of thing? <laughs> um, and it's like, well, I've never heard of you. you, you you're now direct messaging me, which, yeah. which you know, I respect. I respect their attempt, you know, attempt to kind of do something. But do, right. do you think if you are using things like Navigator, for example, that if you get this right, you can make what you're doing on the back end more effective? So it's mm -hmm. like, okay, well, I'm, I've already, you know, if you, if, for example, if you sent me an email, that would have a lot more weight than, than you know, I probably get eight or nine different marketing companies that oh, yeah. promise to deliver me a million in leads. There's, a <laughs> there's still a lot of pitching on LinkedIn. Um, I would say that the direct outreach, the direct messaging used to be more effective on LinkedIn now because it's becoming a little more of like a, a standard social media platform where people just are looking for general value and it kind of turns you off when, when they pitch right away. But I will say with Sales Navigator and those sort of direct outreach campaigns where you want to just find your exact target market, connect right away, pitch way way more effective if you're doing organic content mm. because like me for myself i actually did a direct outreach campaign on linkedin years ago before i ever released a video nobody knew who i was uh it sucked i think like we tried it for like 90 days didn't get a lot of results and now it well first of all i literally don't even do outreach everything comes <laughs> inbound for me i completely 100 percent get all of my business from inbound leads on linkedin from my content but my clients who are, nav uh, are using Sales Navigator, the ones who see the most success are the ones who are coupling Sales Navigator and that direct outreach with an organic content strategy. Um, because then you message someone and they're like, I've seen this guy before. Wait a minute, like I've seen his videos. And then you're a little more validated. You've kind of already done the steps to get to a closer place of trust where pitching becomes more receptive. Um, even one of my video um, associates out here in, in Orange County um, he does direct outreach on LinkedIn and I did a video with him where I featured him on a page. I gave him, you know, production credit, you know, like, thank you for the video. And he said, once I gave him that shout out, a lot of these people, he had like direct outreach message, like the pr previous week, they finally started responding. Cause they saw, they're like, wait a minute. And then they replied to his pitch. Like, yeah, I, I do think we need video. So it's just, a, a, it shows the power of an organic content strategy coupled with outreach. I think that's the missing piece is a lot of people think, I'll just find my target market and pitch. It can work, don't get me wrong, um, but organic content really helps. Hmm. Yeah. And in terms of content, is there certain types of content that works? Like we, we've, I've tried different things like the kind of PDF sliders and videos and pictures, and there's a number of different things you can do. Are there things that, you know, do you need to kind of create a balance? If so, what is that balance mm -hmm. in terms of content that you put out there? Um, I would say video is the best, absolutely most effective in my experience. That's my specialty is video, but having a mix is certainly helpful or repurposing all your highest performing videos into other forms. So if you're like, oh, I, I want to do a LinkedIn article, I don't know what to talk about. Well, go look at everything you've posted for the last month, find what was highest performing, reverse engineer it to create an article around it now because you kind of already have proof that that works. Um, so I would say, even though I'm very video focused personally, having a mix is certainly helpful. Mm. And then the other piece of that is optimize your profile. You know, you can have all the content in the world, but if people land back on your page and all you're doing is bragging about your MBA and your <laughs> Forbes 30 under 30, you're completely missing uh, an opportunity to effectively communicate to your target market that you are in fact the person to solve their problem. So that's a lot, of, like that's like 90% of what I see on LinkedIn. People would have better results if they just clearly communicated what they do. I mean, it's crazy. Like there's no reason I should read your entire LinkedIn summary, go through the whole summary and still be like, okay, but like, what <laughs> do you do? Like, like, are you helping? Like, it, it's just not clear. And a lot of people, again, ego, they try to be fancy, like, you know, we create elaborate blah, blah. It's like, just say it. Just like, don't be fancy. Be very to the point. Like you're explaining it to a six-year-old. You need this six-year-old to understand what you're doing. Do that same thing on your LinkedIn profile. And then when you have leftover characters, <laughs> talk about your MBA and how you were in Forbes. That's fine. <laughs> in terms of the 
frequency of posting. What have you found is, is a good recipe? You know, is it daily, weekly? How, how, how have yeah. you seen success? So the algorithm is really, it, it's uh, fast and hard on LinkedIn. Things die quickly. It's a news feed driven platform because when you go to someone's profile and you go to their posts, they only display it currently in chronological order, which is a pain. No one's going to like sift through, well, maybe they will, but um, it's not like YouTube or Facebook where there's like a library of content. Um, it's all newsfeed driven. So because of that, I would say post every day, um, but also be mindful that your post is going to probably die after 48 hours at the most. It's right. usually like 24 hours and you got to get another post out, another post out. Um, but also repurposed content does really good on LinkedIn because of that reason, because things are hard and fast in the newsfeed and they die. If you do have uh, some high performing videos, I would advise you to eventually, once enough new content has passed again, just repurpose it and post the same thing because it only lived in the newsfeed for a day or two and chances are a lot of people who would find value in that content didn't actually see it yet. Mm. And what about getting uh, comments? Like I've read about it's important to get people to comment straight away. And, yeah, and ask people com to comment. Ask, you know, you don't ask, you don't get. Um, is that important to sort of get it more, you know, more people to see that, is it? Uh, to, so, so if, if people are, if you put something out and people are commenting, does that affect how many more people get to see it? Yes, it absolutely, does? absolutely, especially in the first hour. Um, so the way that social media, this is all platforms, works is you post something and the platform rolls it out to a percentage of your audience, usually based on how generous the platform is at that time with organic reach, but also the, the, the initial percentage they decide to show it to has to do with your past performance and how valuable you are. So let's just use 10% arbitrary example. I release something on LinkedIn, I hit publish, LinkedIn's gonna show that to 10% of my audience, okay? Now, if 9% uh, uh, of that 10%, so 90% of the people it initially got shown to engage and comment with it, the algorithm reads that as, whoa, like almost this entire first tier engage with this. This must be really valuable. We're going to show it to another 10% now, okay? And now when it shows it, rolls it out to that second 10%, if again, nine out of 10 comment and engage, the, the platform's just going to keep going, keep going. And that's actually what viral content <clears throat> is. Viral content is they show it to that initial percentage and the entire percentage engages. And they're like, whoa, let's do it again. And then that entire percentage engages. And then eventually the platform like kind of gives up and just shows it to everyone because they're like every single person is engaging with this content. Um, so that's why a lot of people on LinkedIn are using like engagement pods and things to boost in the first hour because when you get the platform to read, oh, right away in the first hour, people are liking commenting on this, they're just automatically going to show it to more people. Right. What have you seen has been, is, works in terms of style of video posts? Because yours are very ent entertaining, you know, even if you're not interested in what you're talking about, it, they're, the way they're edited and the, and the, and the pace and you, you. you're doing little skits and stuff. But I don't, you know, I, I don't. manipulate people to watch <laughs> what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I obviously couldn't do that. And I'm sure a lot of people don't have those skills to put together those you know what if, if you're kind of pretty basic like myself what are some of the types of video that you can do um, apart from coming to you guys and getting you guys to beautifully edit it but if you yeah. if you're starting off what are some of the tips to kind of get that engagement and get it out to more people do you think um having a clear takeaway so you know following a formula before you ever turn on the camera and you don't need like super high production you don't need to do the cut style like i do you can literally just turn on your camera start filming, you know, the horizontal way, a selfie video um, of you talking, and you can get, get good at it, you know, practice being able to do it in one fluid take if you don't have the resources to do a lot of production and editing. But having a formula that you follow per video where you say, okay, I want the viewer to walk away with something of a, wow, I now realize that I should be doing this to get this result and my life is now better because of this piece of content. Thank you. So, you know, if you're in fitness and, or maybe you're a personal trainer, like I said, they're, they're coming to LinkedIn now. Maybe it's like, um, do you have back pain? You know, here's three quick exercises you can do a couple times a week to alleviate your back pain. You know, that is gonna leave the viewer with, wow, I now realize I could take this action to help with my back pain and my life is now better because of this 
person's content, you know, Susie Jones, like who, who is this Susie Jones? And then that's the intrigue. You know, when, when you're just giving free value to people over and over, they eventually just like respect the hell out of you. I mean, that's what I've done. I, I've not asked for anyone to give me their money. I've not asked for sales, but people want to, because over time they're like, oh my God, this shade chick, she's been <laughs> completely transformed my marketing. And I haven't even paid her a dime. It's just the free advice she gives all the time in her marketing videos has made my life so much better. Now they're an ambassador of you. Now they're going to tell your friends about you. Now when they're at a networking event and someone's like, oh, I need a content strategy for my LinkedIn, they're going to recommend me. Um, so definitely keeping all of your content before you turn on record, knowing exactly what the key takeaway is. What is the user going to walk away with? And what is that one thing, that tangible tip you're going to give them to make their life better? Mm. And then also ending the video with a call to action. What do you think about this topic? Share in the comments below. Not a call to action like, by the way, I'm a personal trainer. Call me right now because that's like, you kind of lose people then. Yeah. Then it's like, oh, wait a minute. This was just like, this was just like low-key an ad for him. I'm not going to comment. Mm -hmm. But if you make it about community, hey, comment down below what you do to alleviate back pain. It's a very common problem in America. What are you guys doing to deal with your back pain? That is actually going to drive more and more comments, get you more and more attention, get more and more people to land on your profile so that you can get some inbound leads, so that you can get some people who just so happen to be looking for a personal trainer and then they land on your profile. They're like, wait a minute, I think this person has what I need and I'm going to reach out to do business. Okay. You mentioned about people generally don't have their good profile set up no. about making it clear what to do. Is there any other common mistakes that people can tweak to to be more successful on LinkedIn? Um, just make content, you know? Create content around your business, around your brand, and be consistent. That's the other thing. A lot of people give up. Uh, you do really have to be consistent. I attribute a lot of my success to being consistent, even on the weeks I didn't feel like it. I stuck with it. Um, actually, in the beginning, I just had a goal to do three original selfie videos per week. So I post every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, they were not highly edited. Literally, the example I just gave of just a one-take selfie video, that's all I did. Um, I did subtitle them, which is very important, but I just stayed consistent. I think there was maybe a week here or there where I missed one, so I only had like two posts go out that week, but I was consistently creating new video content, and I didn't stop. And um, I did get business right away. I definitely had growth and results right away, but I would say once I, uh, before hitting like the year mark, it was like, it was like, um, it was month 10. I was on month 10 of creating these videos. I had scaled up at that point. I was up to like four posts a week by then. Um, that is when I started going viral. Like I think the first time I went super viral was on month 10. And then from month 10 to month 12, I went viral like eight times. What's super viral? What's how big uh, is like that? 500,000. Is that like Corona level? Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, on LinkedIn, almost like anything over 100,000 views is viral on LinkedIn. Right, right. I would say the month 10 is when I started getting like videos that were close to a million, like 10,000 likes, like thousands of comments. That was the first time that really happened to me. And a lot of people saw me, they're like, oh my God, you're blowing up. I'm like, yeah, I've been doing this for a year though. <laughs> I didn't really ever go viral until month 10. I had some high performing stuff. I had some, you know, wins with the content, reaching a lot of people and gaining more followers than average that week. But it wasn't until I hit like the year mark that I started to like consistently see like, I mean, I gained uh, 7,000 followers from one viral video on LinkedIn. Yeah. And that was at about the year mark of me doing content. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's uh, certainly got a, got a way to go then. Uh, and the that. Gary Vee one, which you found me from, that's, right? That's the one I that's found. That's a lot of people are like, I saw you because of Gary Vee. I'm like, I got to redo that video, man. Because <laughs> so many people found me from that. I, I still get a lot of feedback. Like, that's where I first found you was the Gary Vee. I'm like, all right, I guess... Blonde chicks imitating Gary Vee does well on yeah, LinkedIn. He, he probably yeah. needs it every now and again, someone to kind of give him a bit of stick, doesn't he? I think. Yeah. <laughs> and he's big on LinkedIn. A yeah. lot of people follow him on LinkedIn, so yeah. it was a good play. How do you find weekends? Do you do you um, not personally, but in, as it relates to LinkedIn, you know, is that um, an interesting time to post? Not as high performing, but also less people posting, so less competition, so it can go either way. Mm. So I will post on the weekends, but it's more of like content that I don't perceive as going very viral or being the most high performing. I'll just get a post out on the weekends. Um, sometimes I actually use my like weaker time slots, like Saturday night, for example, is like a week time slot for me. 
I'll use it to test content that I personally feel a little insecure about. <laughs> I do feel a little insecure about my videos sometimes, guys. I still do. You know, if I'm like, oof, like, this is just a little too raw, or like, I feel I'm a little too controversial with this one. What if I actually lose followers? You know, I'll post it on a Saturday night because then if it, it if it is destined to go viral, it still will. Mm -hmm. But if I do start to see a lot of negative feedback right away, well, at, at least only a small percentage of my audience saw it and I can delete it right after to <laughs> kind of testing. Yeah, I had that happen with a really spontaneous like rant I did about, uh, it was actually about narcissistic parents, what we were talking about before. I posted on a Saturday night at like 9 p.m. EST because I was like, this is kind of racy. You know, I was like, what's going to happen? And it went viral. It went super viral. So I'm like, oh, shoot, I should have posted it Monday morning, <laughs> you know. But that's also a little, a little tip if you're feeling like unsure about content. Post on the weekends just to like test it. Um, but there's a lot less people on LinkedIn on the weekends right. for sure. Yeah. Okay. So a couple of final questions then. Um, Let's do pe it. People, Rapid fire, Matthew. Let's go. People are, I'm sure you're going to get people who are like, okay, how do I, um, how do I up my LinkedIn game? How do um, I get the suit like that guy's And, got? and how do you get my suit? So I'll, uh, I'll put that yeah. in the comments section. Comment below if you like my suit. <laughs> Use uh, my affiliate link <laughs> to get your suit. <laughs> that's right. Um, yeah, how do, what, what, what are the products? How do people get involved? You mentioned you've got boot camps and you've yeah. got your agency. Tell us all about that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I have a couple main offers right now. One is an online six-week LinkedIn video boot camp. Um, it's an online program, but there are weekly coaching calls with access to me, uh, a lot of exercises. Basically, it's called boot camp for a reason, but it only takes like 45 minutes each weekday to get through the six weeks, and then you come out armed and ready with all the knowledge that I have for how to create videos consistently on your LinkedIn to attract your target market and close more deals. Um, I've had a lot of success with that, transformed a lot of business owners' uh, well belief about what can what they can do with organic content on LinkedIn. Um, but it's essentially like a do-it-yourself program. So it's really ideal for the business owner who is looking to bring social media marketing and, and have that kind of digital acumen in-house long term you know they go through the program and they come out armed and ready with everything i know so they can just apply it to their own channels uh, but then the other uh part of my agency is actually more traditional agency agency services where we will just run your whole linkedin account for you it's really ideal for busy professionals who already have content like a lot of my clients are like um influencers who have a lot of content on other channels but they've done nothing on linkedin so my team just goes, finds the high performing, uh, whatever we see on the other platforms that would be ideal for LinkedIn, repurpose it for LinkedIn, run their page, start to build up their connections and then funnel them uh, any sales that come through LinkedIn as well. So that's a, a way more hands off mm -hmm. route and that's a retainer model, but it's been really beneficial for a lot of these busy professionals who um, already have content. They just mm -hmm. know nothing about LinkedIn and they, and they don't wanna deal with it. So I'm take it off their hands and just funnel sales to the finish line for them. Mm. Are you just US based or do you do international? No, nope, well? international. Uh, I've had a lot of clients in Europe, Australia, um, I think that's it, South America. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Well, we'll put some links on how people can find you, your courses and everything. So, yeah. so check that out. Um, final question then. Escape Your Limits is about escaping what you've believed would be impossible and gone on to make it possible. Mm -hmm. What would be an example of escaping your own personal limits? Um, that you don't need anyone to believe in you but you. Seriously. I mean, like, I went through a really dark time. I was depressed, like I said before. Um, I used to be um, just very lost in that I felt like nobody believed in me but me. And I can see how, for most people, it's very easy to fall victim to, like, I just want to fit in. I just want to have the illusion of I have love and support, so I'm going to give up on my own personal beliefs and what I want for myself deeply to fit in and then have this kind of over, uh, almost like superficial feeling of support. Um, I denied that, and it was a very lonely road. Like, I can see why people don't do that. But in the end, I was right. I was right about everything I believed in. You know, I was like, you know what? I don't think I need a degree. I don't think I need college. I think I was made to be on camera. I think that I could make it as an entertainer. I don't know how I'm gonna do it, but I'm gonna figure out a way to make money doing more of what I love than just taking the safe route so that everyone can support me 
I was for a very long time the only person who believed in me, and I did it. I fucking did. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> but it is like I mean, I I think at the end of the day, you believing in yourself is most important, and you're gonna find other people eventually. It does take time. I have an army of people who now also support and believe in me, but it literally started with myself not falling victim to the, oh, this is so lonely and hard for me, so I'm just going to do what everyone wants me to do. I just believed in myself, and every night I prayed and I wrote in my journal my intentions, my manifestations, what am I going to create in my life, and it works. It really does work. So definitely, if you have a dream, if you have a goal, if you have something that keeps you up at night thinking like, oh, if only my life could be this, I really want to do this, do it because you're going to be on your deathbed and you're going to have wish that you did that. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.